morning we're going to talk about discouragement. And it seems like one of the greatest tools that the devil uses is discourage followers of Christ to get them down to think, hey, what's the use anymore? Why do I even fight? What, what do I do? I was reading some things that, that kind of shocked me this past week. In 1974, the leading cause of death for youth ages 15 to 21 years old was automobile accidents. Kind of amazing, automobile accidents. Same study was done in the early 90s. What was the main cause of death for youth between ages 15 and 21? Drug overdose. 2023, they did a survey just last year. What do you suppose the leading cause of death between 18 and 25 year olds? Suicide. Suicide. Amazing. That our kids today, young kids, and even younger than that, get to the point in their life where they feel that they just can't do it anymore. They're so discouraged, they're so down, the only thing they can think of is to end their life. But it doesn't end at the age of 21. One of the fastest growing waves of death for our senior saints, people over 65, is suicide. suicide. What in the world is going on? Why do we get to that point in our life where we say, gosh, I just can't do it anymore? And there's a lot of things that cause us to get discouraged in our life, so that's what we're going to look at today. So it's easy to become discouraged, right? It's easy to get down. Discouraged comes in, in, many, in many ways to all of us. Sometimes it comes to our circumstances of just daily living. It happens to us all. We've got to deal with people and work and things around us and finances and all that the world calls upon us. And sometimes we allow these things just to stop us right there in our tracks. Sometimes it doesn't take much to give up on our goals and dreams completely because we say, I'm tired of fighting. I'm tired of doing this. I, I, I can't do it any longer. We say to ourselves, I, it's too tough. I might as well quit. My ideas and dreams before me are just foolish thoughts. There's no way that I could ever accomplish these dreams. It's impossible. And oh, how the devil loves to get that in our lives. It's impossible to live as a Christ, or Christ follower today. It's impossible to live what God has called us to do in his word and to get us discouraged in our faith walk. But right along with our own negative thoughts, there are always those people around us that say, I don't think you should ever attempt that. You'll never succeed. I think you should quit while you're ahead. Don't think of the dreams in front of you because you know, there's just no way that you can accomplish that. There are always those discouragers around us that want to frustrate God's plan in our life. Now, I know this is going to seem, you know, kind of hard for you to believe. It's, I, I mean, finding myself hard to believe, but I struggled in school. I was kind of the, the kid that uh, always had to go to those special ed classes, you know, because I couldn't spell with beans, and, you know, I didn't like math, and I was bored, and I just, I just didn't like it. You know, I know that's hard for you to believe, the, the wise, intelligent guy that I am today. <laughs> but then came my senior year of high school, you know, I... I was more interested in, in, in spending time out on the farm and being away from school. And you know, I did all right in school, but I, I just didn't want to be in class. And then God has a, a strange way of saying, you know, I want to place a call in your heart to become a pastor. And I'm like, that is the last thing that I want to do. <laughs> you know, I, I just wanted to go out and farm and be on the land and raise livestock. And who in the world wants to go to college and you know, I even went to, I was even looking at college to, to fly an airplane, be an airline pilot. There's, there has to be a lot of things better than being a pastor. But how God continues to work and mold our lives. And I remember going to the school counselor, because he had to meet with all the seniors and try to get things arranged for colleges and stuff. And I had applied to Northwestern College, and he looked at me and said, oh, crap. What are you thinking? Now, you'd think a school counselor would be encouraging. Mm -hmm. <laughs> This, this guy had no encouragement in him. And uh, he just kind of looked at me and said, you know, Brad, 
you know, I, I know how badly you hate school and how badly you hate to study. Don't go to college. Just be happy on the farm doing your thing. You'll never make it through college. Wow. I go home and I'm starting to think about that and think, of, man, I got God's call here. God's calling me here. And yet I got this counselor who's supposed to know about how kids think and react and how they should go to college and telling me not to go to college. What do I do? I'm glad I didn't listen to that. Those people in our lives that try to discourage us and bring us down. How many have had those in your life? Hey, you're going the wrong direction. You can't do that. Well, today we're going to be looking at the, the book of Ezra. How many have studied the book of Ezra lately? You know, it's not a popular book that we like to study and, and look at, but there are some great truths in, in God's Word. So, in the book of Ezra, in 539 B.C., God moved upon the heart of Cyrus the king to help all the exiles return back and to rebuild the temple that God had been, that had been destroyed 50 years before. And Cyrus the king said, anyone that wants to return to Jerusalem... To build the temple, you're free to return. And he said, I give you full authority to rebuild the temple. But I'm also going to give you resources. I'm going to give you all the timber and the wood that you need. I'm going to give you all the gold and silver. And on top of that, I'm going to give you the cash to do it. And any human resources, any help that you need, you have the green light to rebuild the temple. Isn't that amazing? Come back. Build the temple to all of its splendor. And they were going. They were good to go. The people returned and they were full steam ahead, rebuilding the original foundation of Solomon's temple. And that's where we find in this morning's scripture passage. Ezra chapter 3, beginning verse 10. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priest in their vestments and with trumpets and the Levites, the son of Asaph, with cymbals, took their places to what? Praise to Lord. praise. <clears throat> to praise the Lord, as prescribed by David, king of Israel. And with praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord. They sang, He is good. His love endures forever. Now, can you imagine what's going on here? The people are coming back to Jerusalem to build the temple that was destroyed years before, and they're excited, and they get the foundation laid, and they're gathering together, and they're shouting, He is good! God's love endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But listen to this. But many of the older priests and the Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple, they wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. No one could distinguish the shouts of joy from the sounds of weeping, because the people made so such a noise, and the sound was heard far away. There was excitement there. A great opportunity to rebuild the temple. And when the foundation was laid, they took time to have a time of praise. Wow. Here's a key for something in all of our lives. There is always a time to praise and turn to God. Now you say, well, you know, Brad, that, that, that's hard to do. How can I do that when, I, when I'm feeling down and discouraged? <clears throat> we don't praise God when the project is finished. Our praise must come at all times in our life. Is God finished with our lives right now? No, we're, we're a work in progress. We should continue to praise at all times. A lot of times we want to come and praise, oh, the project is finished, let's Let's have a, a big open house and a celebration, and let's celebrate. But praise should come at all times. 
The priests came out with trumpets and the Levites with cymbals and, and led the time of praise and worship. And they kept on singing, God is good. His love endures forever. The young people shouted praise to the Lord. And many of the older generation wept because what did they do? They remembered the old temple. And they're weeping because, you know what? It will never be as good as that. But if when we read in Haggai chapter 2, Haggai proph prophesied that the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house. They were building something great, something to behold. And they took some time out to praise. God, I hope you're praising God. Now you go to the doctor and you hear news that probably you really don't want to hear, right? But yet God has blessed some great doctors and nurses to care for just you. And you probably think, man, you know, it, it's hard to, to praise God. You know, I'm going through a tough time. But God's still laying a foundation. Praise the Lord. You know, we all go through those tough times where we get so busy so occupied in everything that God is doing in our lives. And we just have to take time out to praise. You know, and when we're done praising, guess how we feel? A lot better. When we can like, turn our attention to our Father who loves us so very much, it changes our whole attitude and perspective on life around us. So here were the people they are praising God the foundation was going to be built. So far, so good, right? But then things begin to change for everything. Everyone was not happy about the Israelites successfully rebuilding the temple, and they wanted to stop the work. Just there is there is in our lives, when we're excited and we want to do something great for our families or for God, there's always that, that resistance that wants to stop us. And that's what causes us to get discouraged. We have those times of praise and life looks so good. And then within a matter of moments or days, we're crushed and we're down and saying, God, what in the world are you up to? So that's why I ask you to turn to chapter 4 of Ezra, verses 1 through 5. When the what? Enemies. Enemies. Let's think about that for a moment. There are a lot of forces, those enemies that want to crush us and destroy us. There are a lot of those people that, that don't want us to grow in our faith. They don't want us to be excited about our salvation. There are enemies out there, and they want to crush us. So right here, within the first few verses of chapter 4, when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel... They came to Zerubbabel and to the heads of the families and said, Let us help build, because we like you. We seek your God, and we have been sacrificing to him since the time of Urshadon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Jeshua, and the rest of the heads of the families of Israel answered, you have no part with us in building a temple to our God. We alone will build it for the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, commanded us. And then the peoples around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building. They hired counselors to work against them and to what? Frustrate them frustrate their plans during the entire reign of Cyrus, the king of Persia, and down to the reign of Darius, the king of Persia. Wow. In the previous chapter, the people are shouting and excited, but you know what? The enemy said, hey, we got to stop this. This can't continue. So how does this all happen? One of the first things that causes discouragement in life is through the term of deception. We're deceived at, at looking at those things around us. Oh, how often we're fooled by the looks of something. How many have had an apple? It, just, it was a beautiful apple. 
and you bit right into it, and right in the middle of that apple was a worm and all that rotten stuff inside. Yeah. Or you're cutting it to make an apple pie, and, and you cut it open. You may look at the outside, it looks beautiful, except a one little bitty, bitty tiny hole. A little worm got in there and started eating the flesh of that apple, and now it's ruined. Just think you're so excited to bite in that crisp, hard apple, but there's nothing worse than finding a worm that has destroyed the inside. It looks good on the outside, but it's terrible on the inside. Deception. Chapter 4 begins by saying, when the enemies, there are so many forces out there that want to prevent us from succeeding in our walk of faith. The enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord. They came to Zerubbabel saying, let's help build this house. Because like you, we seek your God. Now that sounds like a good thing, doesn't it? Hey, we're, we're busy building this huge, beautiful temple. It's a temple to God. It has to be done right. You know, more hands, the better, right? That's great news. The more, the merrier. <clears throat> oh, man, we could sure use your help. But who were they? What did it say? What? Enemies. Enemies. They were enemies. Why would you invite an enemy into your house? They help you. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua, the rest of the heads of the family said, No! You have no part in building this temple with us to our God, for we alone will build it. Why would they turn down help? Because they were enemies. enemies. I wondered who these enemies were and why they rejected them outright. And I found out that they didn't love the Lord their God because they also worshipped false gods. They were not true to the holy God of Israel. They were deceivers. In 2 Kings chapter 17, it tells us that the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon and a number of other places and settled into Samaria to replace the Israelites. And while they lived there, they did not worship the Lord, it says. They persisted to their former practices. And even while they were worshiping the Lord, they were still worshiping other idols. They didn't love the Lord their God only. They were enemies. When we allow enemies to come into our house, nothing, nothing good can come up. Did you hear that? When we let enemies come into our house, nothing good will come of it. I get a call from Trisha and Cody and James and Eli. They're so excited. They got chickens. <laughs> How in the world do you have chickens? There's bears around there. Bears like to eat. Chickens, you know. Oh no, we got a you got a cage. You know, they, you know they're, they're okay. They'll, they'll be fine. But what happens if we take that cage and we leave it open for the bears to get in? They're gonna eat them. They're gonna destroy it. That's just common sense, right? It seems so simple to us, but then we do the same thing in our lives. We allow the bears, the enemies to come into our lives, whether it's at our home, whether it's at our work, with our friendships, and we say, it's okay. You know, I'm guilty of it too. Look at the garbage we watch on television. Yes? We allow our kids to watch us on television, and there's alternative lifestyles, there's language, it, it, it's a mess, but we're letting it right into our home. Can any good come of that? The people we hang out with, we say, oh, you know, he, he's, a, he's a good friend. I know he, he uses bad language. He's a big drinker. He, he doesn't serve the Lord. And, you know, but, hey, I like hanging with him. We'll just do, you know, we do our things. And we go out this summer and we go party on the boat for a while. Can anything good come of that? You know, we can say, hey, I'm, I'm there to minister to this person. 
Oh, absolutely. But when you start taking in their lifestyles, what happens? It's going to hurt. When you start accepting the lifestyles of, of the world and all the activities of the world, it's going to hurt. What's happening to the church? We start letting it into our, our churches. The idea is a society that, oh, everything's okay, right? Is it? <clears throat> you know, we get discouraged when we start letting the wolves, the foxes, into the chicken house. So right here in this scripture passage you're reading, the what? The enemies. It didn't say the good people or the neighbors or, or nice people. It said the enemies said, let's help Bill. And praise God, what did they say? No. no. We're not going to let you build. Wow. And I believe the leadership knew already there's nothing but trouble. So they said, no. They didn't say, well, well, maybe we'll let you, you know, take care of some of the woodwork over here. They blatantly said, no. No to the offer because they perceived that they were trying to deceive them by just being a good part of the group. There are times, my friends, when we have to say no. no. Let's say it once. No. no. Let's come on. We can do it better than that. Sometimes we just have to say no. 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 You know, thanks, Briar. <laughs> you know, there, some, we don't like to say no, do we? We like to appease people. Let's get along. We can all be happy. But there are times when it comes to our lives and we're dealing with the enemies, we have to say no. no. You're not going to take me down. And one of the ways that discourages will frustrate God's plans in our life is through this deception. It's okay. It looks good. Let me tell you, when it looks too good to be true, guess what? It is. I had one of my workers come to me the other day and he says, you know, he said, Brad, he says, get on Facebook. I said, why, why do I want to be on Facebook? He said, let me show you something. He said, Callaway Golf is, is giving away a whole bunch of golf clubs for free to everybody. All you got to do is fill out this form and, and send in $25 for a shipping thing, and, and you're going to get three Callaway Golf Clubs. <laughs> oh, my goodness, how painful it is sometimes. If it sounds too good to be true, guess what? It is. But that's how we're deceived. The devil wanted to deceive these people by saying, hey, I'm going to help build your temple. And you say, oh, that sounds good, right? But they're only there to destroy. And we end up to be the losers. Can you think of the times in your life when discouragers came to you in the form of deception and then it was too late? Then we're going to take the next step. You see, when the offer to help was rejected, these enemies, what? They became hostile, and now they're really out to harm them. So the second form of this of discour is discouragement. We get down, right? We start thinking, oh, this is terrible. In 1798, in a Scottish manufacturing town of Newcastle, a young woman began teaching Sunday school class to poverty-stricken young boys. These were the boys that lived on the streets that could no longer support themselves, and they, they were homeless kids. And there was a little boy named Robert. He was always running with the wrong crowd, but this teacher said, there's something special about him. So she invited him to Sunday school, and he started to attend, and he went for about a month and gave him some new clothes and tried to get him going in the right path of life, but all of a sudden he stopped going to Sunday school. So the teacher went out looking for him. And even though the church had given Robert some new clothes, she found him, and they were already shabby, dirty, and torn up. She said, Robert, let's go back to Sunday school. She said, come with me. And she gave him some new clothes, and the next week he was back to Sunday school. The next week he was back to Sunday school, and he was learning about Jesus. But this little boy's friend said, you can't go there. That's a bad place. They're going to ruin you. He chose to play again. The teacher went out another time to find him, and when she did, she discovered that, that now he was angry and almost mean because his friends were telling him that he shouldn't go to Sunday school. 
The new clothes that she had given to him earlier were now being worn by the other bully of the, of the group. And the Sunday school teacher went back to a friend at church and she says, I guess, you know, I just got to give up on it. It's not worth it, right? We keep on giving him clothes. His friends keep on misleading him and taking him astray. She says, I can't do it. And his friend said, don't do that. Don't, don't give up on Jesus. There's still hope. Go one more time. They went one more time. They brought new clothes for him. He started to attend Sunday school, and then this time he didn't stop. He kept on going. That little boy at the age of 18 accepted Christ as his Savior. He became the first Protestant missionary to China. He translated the whole Bible into Chinese. And he brought the word of God to millions and millions of people. Because he didn't give up. How many of us have thought, I gotta give up? Or I gotta give up caring. I gotta give up praying for this person because I've been praying and praying and praying. And I don't see any answers. Give up! It's not worth it! <clears throat> don't, don't, don't do that. Discouragement shouts in our life over and over again. Quit! You're not doing any good. You'll never succeed. There's always, always someone out there that wants to discourage and take you down. And Cindy, I'm sure working with the kids that you work with, at times you just want to say, oh my goodness. But don't, don't, don't give up. Some of you like the old Charlie Brown comic strips. You know, who was his nemesis? Lucy. Oh, how we love Lucy. How many of us have Lucy's in our lives? You know? Charlie Brown goes to his old friend Lucy who just took the football away from him and kicked it to the sky. And there's poor old Charlie Brown. Lucy, nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. And Lucy just kind of smiles and kind of to listens to him. He says, Lucy, do you see that plane flying up in the sky? It's a plane full of people going somewhere else. That's what I would love to do. I'd like to go somewhere else, somewhere where nobody knows me. The new people that know me would get to have a, a good fresh start with me. Do you think that's what I ought to do, Lucy? Do you think I need to get a new fresh start with people who don't know me at all? Oh, Lucy, with her words of wisdom, said, forget it, Charlie Brown, forget it. Once the new people get to know you, they'll be back, right back where you started at. Nobody will like you. Boy, with friends like that, who needs enemies, right? We all have those Lucys in the world around us. Nobody will like you. You'll never be accepted. You'll never be smart enough or know enough. The Lucys of this world tell us that we're not much and we never will be. And they only come to hurt and destroy. Lucy is that snob that we know. That always knows more than we do. They show it with an attitude of, I'm better than you. They think they're better by the clothes that they wear, the house that they live in, the cars that they drive. Those are those Lucy's. Lucy is that social butterfly who's always out having that new and exciting experience that we wish we could only have. They're the ones that have it made in the shade. And they make sure that you know it, that they're better than you are. The Lucy's of this world parade their knowledge, and it really bugs the rest of us who feel that we can never measure up. Because most of us feel like Charlie Brown at times. We're always a day late and a dollar short. We just don't keep to the time of the marching band. And they want us to say that we're less than they are. All those Lucy's. But you know what? We're God's kids. We've all been created special. As one who claims, you're mine. God wants to bless us and use us. 
Don't let the Lucy's of this world discourage you. Because we're God's. So also as we read in this passage, the third thing that we find out is fear. The discouragement continues to grow now in the form of fear, and it comes in many ways. The fear of failure. The fear that people will get upset with us. The fear that we're going to lose our friends. The fear that people might harm us. The, fe the fear that people might think that we're weird. Mark, you're weird. <laughs> we know you are, but that's okay. I like it that way. You like it that way. <laughs> Randy, how about it? Do you feel weird at times? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you're just a weirdo. She tells me that all the time. She, <laughs> <laughs> Does it matter what the world thinks? If we're living for Christ and he's in the center of our life, that's okay. You know, one of our biggest problems is we spend way too much time thinking of what people think of us rather than we think about what God thinks of us. There are all kinds of people that want to wear us down and scare us from doing what God has called us to do. Has fear kept you from doing what you knew that God wanted you to do? Did you continue? Did you quit? How can we fail to fall for falling for this trap when it's all set up by discouragers around us? You know, we may wake up and say, you know what, I want to do something great for the church. I feel this calling in my life, and, and I, I really want to step out and do it. And then you start hearing some people around you, and, oh, I better not. It may cost too much, it may take too much time or energy, and we don't do it. Shame on us. God has placed a clear-cut vision. Go out and do it. A vision of what God is wanting you to do in your life, in your family, or in your ministry. Don't let fear take that away from you. Don't be so scared that you just never start the project. The builders in Ezra's day were not only excited about building the temple, not only did they praise and worship God, but they knew that it was something that God wanted to have done. So let me ask you, what is God doing in your life that he wants done in your life, in your family, and in your church? And then go out and do it. Don't be afraid. But then a second way of learning how the Lord is trying to lead us is on a daily basis. Learn how to recognize his voice among all the voices of the world. Are you listening to God? Do you learn from him in his word? Are we studying God's Word? Seventy-eight percent of active Christian people that attend church more than three times a month. Okay, that's pretty active church people. Only seventy-eight percent of them read the Bible more than what they hear in church. Seventy-eight percent of people only hear the Bible in church on a Sunday morning, and they don't read it the rest of the week. How in the world does that work? We wonder why the church is struggling and why the church is hurting. We're not listening to God. We're out there listening to all the other people in the world, and we're not even listening to God's Word. Seventy-eight percent of active Christians aren't reading God's Word other than what they hear on Sunday morning. That's amazing. I work for a man named Ed. Great guy. But if I never wanted to listen to him or find his encouragement or even to find what he wants done, guess what's, what's going to happen? I'm going to fail, right? In our marriage relationships, if we're not listening to each other, what's going to happen? We're going to fail. How do we expect that the same in, a, in our life of Christ? We listen to all the things out in the world, but we're not listening to him in his word. Keep in touch with the Lord on a daily basis in prayer and learning in him, from him in his word. Because otherwise we're going to get terribly discouraged and we're going to be filled with fear. Because God tells us, do not be afraid. Can you say that? Do not be afraid. Or do not fear. Over and over, do not fear for I am with you. But if we're not with God, obviously we're going to be filled with fear. Don't fall for the trap that everything's going to be perfect in your life. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, it says, 
Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial that you're about to suffer. It says something strange is happening to you. When we follow Christ, at times it's going to be tough. But we got a God who loves us and cares for us so much. And he says, don't be afraid. It's going to be okay. Keep moving forward. And the last thing that keeps us frozen in our tracks are they hired people in Ezra to work against them. <coughs> Can you believe that? These enemies hired counselors and, and people to work, and, and these counselors would work with the people who were building the temple to discourage them. To whisper in their ears, Jeff, you're not smart enough, you're not good enough, you can't do it, don't do it. These counselors were telling people to, to stop, to give up. You know, that's one of the things in our world. Satan uses in the greatest way people to work against us. The enemies hired counselors to give advice. They pretended to be advising them in the best way, but really giving them bad advice. The enemies, did you hear that? The enemies hired these experts to stop the building. You know, there are all kinds of experts out in the world that want to lead you. But they want to lead you down the wrong path. Go to any bookstore, Barnes & Noble, and there's all kinds of, of books to help you, right? Books to give you great advice, right? There are pastors that, that we see on television who are false teachers that want to give us great advice. But it's wrong. If it's not based in God's word. There's only one place that we can find the best advice ever, and that's where? Bible. Right here. And when you're lost and you feel that you want to give up, let God speak to you. There are all kinds of people that want to intimidate you, that want to say, hey, I care for you, man, Jeff. You're a good guy. I care for you. But you know what? Give up. Doesn't work that way. Because God says, don't, no, don't, don't give up. You're building something great and something beautiful. Keep our eyes on the word. And God will bless us. Let me ask you, have you ever had people tell lies on you in order to, to cause problems in your life? That try to mislead you? Oh, there are just some people that love to watch others fail, right? Don't fall for that. Keep on going and building something great for God's people. So let's think about this. When we're weak, when we're to the point of saying, I can't do it anymore. What is it? Is it the deceivers that are, are leading you astray? Is your heart filled with discouragement saying, I can't do it? Are you sitting in your shoes just shaking because you're so scared and filled with fear? Are other people leading you down the wrong path? Are you aware? It all goes down to one main basic purpose. Who are you listening to? Who are you following? Are you listening to the people around you that want to discourage you? Or are you listening to God that wants to lift you up and bless you? God's word says, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Do you believe? Heavenly Father, we think about the world around us that wants to, to lead us and say, hey, follow us and we'll take care of you. Let us not fall for these false promises and let's not be afraid. Let us go on with courage because God is with us wherever we go. Father, I just pray that you may place on every person here, every person that's listening to me, a, something on their heart that they can go out and serve you with all courage. Let them not be discouraged. Let them follow through with, with conviction. 
with your love and your grace, and most of all, with word and prayer, to do something great in your kingdom. And Father, when the world comes out to stop them, when the world comes out to shut them down, Father, may they say, I come in the name of the Lord. He is with me. Bless us, Father, in all that we do and say. In your name we pray. Amen. Can you do that? Can you sing wherever you go? Yeah. People may say, man, you're weird. That's okay. It's okay being weird, right, Randy? Yeah. Let's sing wherever we go. Go out the blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go and enjoy Amen. your day.